without further ado, today it's our honor and pleasure for Oggi, eh, vou falar em inglês porque esse seminário vai ser em inglês. Um, today it's our honor and pleasure to have Sixi Razanen from Helsinki University. Um, he received his education, undergraduate, PhD, and Livra Docencia at Helsinki University, where he's now a permanent researcher. But he also did several postdocs and visiting researchers such as at the University of uh, at CERN, at the University of Oxford, in Washington University. He was a researcher at the University of Chicago in Kobe in Japan, and also it, he was a visiting lecturer, a visiting professor at Birzeit University in Palestine. And today he's going to talk about um, Higgs inflation, how to close cosmology with a standard model. Uh, please, go, please go ahead. One more thing. I will put the, he graciously gave, gave us the files and I will put them on chat. Um, everyone, please mute yourself. Everyone, please mute yourself and I will unmute you. If you will ask the question, put in the chat. Para estudantes, como sempre, temos lista de presencia. Por favor, põe em chat o seu nome, o seu número de array. Eu vou registrar. Muito obrigado. Uh, Sixi, you can start. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, and I'd like to really encourage you to ask questions uh, during the talk. So, just please send a message to the chat so that then Giorgio will uh, unmute your microphone. So, I will not be looking at the chat uh, during the talk. Let me share my screen so we can get started. Uh, Yes. Can you see my presentation, Giorgio? Just to check. You can unmute your own microphone and confirm that you're seeing the PowerPoint. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. We can. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I would like to talk about the connecting, as Georgios said, the standard model Higgs field, uh, which is a central piece of the standard model with inflation, which is the most successful scenario for the early universe. And uh, I would like to start with a bit of philosophy uh, that's sort of underlying these ideas. But if you don't like it, you can just forget about it because it's not, uh, and then we can, you can start from the physics. But uh, uh, the, in starting from the 1980s, moving on to the 1990s and then to the 2000s, it was widely expected that there would be physics beyond the standard model at the electroweak scale. And of course, it's a one of the biggest experimental results, a null result, but still a big result in the 2000s, that no such physics has been seen at the LHC contrary, I would say, to the expectations of most people, cer certainly contrary to the expectations expressed in most papers on uh, particle physics uh, before the LHC turned on. However, of course, such physics was also not seen at LEP2 at CERN, and was also not seen at Tevatron, uh, contrary to expectation. And uh, this failure to find new physics has then caused a lot of reassessment of theoretical ideas about particle physics, in particular the hierarchy problem. So if there is a gut scale, why is there such a big difference between the gut scale and the electroweak scale? I would like to mention uh, also another experimental piece of evidence that's also, very, that's also quite important, which is direct detection experiments of dark matter. So, uh, In, super, in supersymmetric theories of beyond the standard model, uh, there is a stable, there is often a stable uh, electrically neutral particle uh, that can constitute the dark matter. Uh, this is certainly a virtue of models such as the minimal supersymmetric standard model, and some people will even claim that it's a prediction. And there's a so-called WIMP miracle, namely that if you take a mass that's about 100 GeV, uh, that has self-interactions 
of the order of, with cross section of the order of the weak cross section, and then the relic density uh, through self annihilation. So if the if the if it's a thermal relic, so if the density today is determined by self annihilation processes in thermal equilibrium, then the relic density uh, today matches the observed dark matter density. However, then you would expect that this particle would also interact with non-standard molecular particles, in particular protons and neutrons, by the weak interactions, so then you could find it in direct detection. So this is the latest uh, direct detection data. Uh, so this is from uh, xenon one ton, which at, the, which at present is the most which at present is the most sensitive experiment. So on the x-axis is the mass of the dark matter particle in units of uh, GeV. And on the y-axis is the WIMP nucleon cross-section in centimeters squared. And if you look at xenon one ton, above that is Lux and Panda X2. Uh, so if you look now look at around this electroweak scale, so around 100 GeV, the constraint is about 10 to the minus 46. So everything above this line is excluded. Now, so the constraint is 10 to the minus 46 centimeters squared. However, the cross section for a particle whose mass is around this weak scale and with weak scale interactions is 10 to the minus 36. So it's completely off the scale. It's 10 orders of mag excluded by 10 orders of magnitude. So we can, re so we can say uh, that the, what we have learned in the 2000s is that there are no dark matter particles that have weak scale masses, weak scale interactions with ordinary matter, and also, of course, that no such, uh, no new uh, weak scale physics has been found in colliders. Uh, the one simple explanation for this is simply that there is no physics close to the electroweak scale. And then the way to solve the hierarchy problem, for example, is simply that there is no scale at all above the electroweak scale before gravity becomes important. So if there is no God scale, then the question of why is there a difference between the God scale and the electroweak scale completely disappears. Uh, then you would say, okay, but we need new physics to explain observations. And typically uh, people would argue that you need physics beyond standard model for first of all, inflation or some other process that gives you the, explains the seeds of structure that we see today. Inflation is of course the most successful scenario, but in principle it could have something else and alternatives have been discussed. Uh, you need to have dark matter or modified gravity, somewhat less possibly, and then you need to generate the uh, asymmetry between baryonic matter and antimatter. Now, However, what I, I will discuss now, how standard model Higgs may be sufficient to give you inflation. If there is time at the end of, or if, and if there is interest, I may even discuss a little bit how Higgs alone could explain the dark matter without any new particle species, Higgs in connection with inflation. You still need new physics for baryogenesis, but actually you can do both baryogenesis as well as dark matter if you don't explain it by Higgs. Uh, with physics below the electroweak scale. So if you add, for example, three right-handed neutrinos to the standard model, quite a natural and simple addition, put them below the electroweak scale, you can do baryogenesis and dark matter. However, today I want to concentrate uh, on inflation. So uh, here I have the relevant parts of the standard model Lagrangian. So H is the standard model Higgs field. So VH is the standard uh, potential for the Higgs. So uh, it's, so which is um, in the field range that's relevant for inflation, it's uh, quartic. And then we have this canonical kinetic term, G alpha beta is of course the metric. And then here combined, we have the Einstein-Hilbert action. So R is the Ricci scalar, M Planck squared is the Planck mass. Uh, and we have one extra term, which is Xi H squared R. So if you take the standard model with its field content, and you take the Einstein-Hilbert action, so usual general relativity with its field content, which is of course only the metric, uh, 
and you put them together, then there is exactly one term, which is dimension four, and that you can write down with this combined field content that you cannot write down only in general relativity, nor only in standard model. And that's this minimally coupled term, uh, where psi is a constant. Now, if you don't like this philosophy that you should write down all possible terms, uh, then of course, if you don't write this term in the beginning, at the classical level, then if you just put the standard model in curved space time and renormalize, you will generate this term. And, uh, this and of course, this also runs. So even if you put it to zero on some scale, it will be non-zero on all other scales. So this non-minimal coupling term is not optional. It's something that is really a necessary part of your theory. Uh, and it was realized in 2007 by Fedor Pesrukov and Misha Shaposhnikov, both at the time in Lausanne, uh, that if you include this term, you can do Higgs Hig inflation with only the Higgs field. And it's quite interesting that this was realized so late, uh, because inflation, of course, was proposed uh, as a particle physics solution to cosmological problems by Kazanas and after him Goose, both in 1980. And both Kazanas and Goose were discussing uh, grand unified theory scalar fields. And after that, in the 1980s, most of the focus, you know, was on physics at, uh, at the grand unified scale or between the electroweak scale and the grand unified scale. And the idea was very much that there's no point in discussing what the standard model Higgs does because we have so many other fields. So by the time you get to high energies, the behavior will be something completely different. And uh, now that the philosophy, now the philosophy in 2000 philosophy has shifted, then people went back and looked, oh, Maybe if you have only the Higgs, we, we, can, we can make it work. But all of these pieces were there already in the, in the 90s, or actually already in the 80s, in the end of the 80s. So this could have been realized, you know, 20 years earlier. So let me go through this uh, basic idea. And, and again, I, I encourage you to, to uh, interrupt me and ask questions if it's unclear. So uh, let me put the Planck mass here to one because I can't be bothered to carry mass parameters around. Um, now, it's easiest to analyze inflation uh, by doing a field transformation such that we get rid of the non-minimal coupling. So, uh, we can do a field transformation to get rid of this non-minimal coupling uh, simply by uh, shifting or dilating the metric by this factor one plus xi h, xi h squared to power minus one. And uh, it's easy to see uh, if you look at this action. So this is the metric with the indices down. With the indices up, you have the inverse metric. So the inverse metric goes with this factor in the parentheses to power plus one. And then you have the determinant. This metric is four by four matrix. So square root of the determinant gives you two powers of this factor. So you have from the determinant this factor to power minus two. Then in front of the uh, Ricci scalar term or the Ricci tensor term, which is Ricci tensor contract with the Ricci scalar, you have one power. Inverse metric gives you minus one. Uh, sorry, it gives you one power of this. So that gives you, uh, so then this disappears. And the physics, at least classically, doesn't depend on how you mix fields. So you can do any sorts of field transformations and physics will be invariant. This is because this is just the choice of coordinates in field space and there's no preferred frame in field space. Uh, when you go to the quantum theory, the situation is a bit more tricky and I will not be discussing that. There it's basically not known whether you have a dependence on the frame. So if you do this transformation, uh, then what happens is that uh, this factor that is in front of the Ricci term will get transferred. First of all, you have minus two powers of this in the potential. And also you have one, one power of this, so in minus one power, so one inverse power of this in the kinetic term. And it's quite easy to see. If you look at these first two terms, you have the, so the Ricci, uh, there's also additive power which comes from the Ricci tensor. So I'm not going to discuss that. But if you forget that for a moment, you just, in this Ricci scale up, Part you have 
one part is the inverse metric, and then one part is one plus psi h squared. So now if you do a multiplication such that you get this one plus psi h squared from here, you will get the same power multiplication into the kinetic term. So you transfer this term from, from the kinetic term. So the kinetic term of a large field values will go like uh, dh dh over h squared. To recover a canonical kinetic term, we define a new field chi. Uh, so what's inside the square root, the details are not important. I mean, these detailed numbers. The only important thing here is that uh, because of this, that you have dh dh divided by h squared. So when you go to large field values, uh, the new, you get a logarithm, which means that the new old field is exponential in terms of the new field. So this means that polynomial potential gets transferred into a sum of exponentials. So if you look at this in a bit more detail, so now uh, chi is the field with the canonical kinetic term. So now the action is just we have standard gravity described by the Ricci scalar, and then we have a minimally coupled scalar field, canonical kinetic term with the potential. So this is the normal setting for inflation. And this potential u chi, so it's the old potential divided by the square of this conformal factor. Now, because the Higgs potential goes like h to power four at large field values, and this conformal, uh, so, uh, sorry, and this uh, coupling to the Ricci scalar, this phenomenon coupling goes like h squared, so that's h squared squared, so it's a constant. And because these fields, these powers of h get transferred to exponentials, this means that this potential is exponentially flat. So this is very good for inflation. Recall, in inflation, the central thing is that you, you should have a field uh, that is rolling on a potential that's flat so that the field rolls slowly. Uh, and these sorts of plateau potentials uh, have been looked at since the 1980s. And in this case, the observables uh, depend uh, on the number of e-folds. So n is the number of e-folds. So this is the... Uh, quantifies the amount of expansion between the time when the mode that we observe in the cosmic microwave background exit the Hubble radius during inflation and freeze and today, uh, sorry, and the, and the end of inflation. So NS is the scalar spectral index. So NS equals one means that the scalar perturbations produced by inflation would be perfectly scale invariant. And for this plateau, they're given just by one minus two over N. And R is the tensor to scalar ratio. So the higher is M, the bigger is the amplitude of the gravitational waves relative to the scalar perturbations. It's just 12 over N squared. And AS is the amplitude of the scalar perturbations of the C and B. So observationally, this is about two times 10 to the minus nine. And this is proportional to the higgs cauchy coupling lambda divided by xi squared. Xi is the normal coupling between the Higgs and the Ricci scalar and proportional to n squared. Now, if we, uh, usually in most inflationary models, there is an ambiguity in the number of e-folds. I mean, so, so you can calculate, if you, so if you know what is your scale, energy scale of inflation, then you can, then you know uh, what is the Hubble parameter, then you know what is the wavelength of the modes when they freeze, and then you can calculate how much does the universe have to expand so that we see those modes at a certain scale on the sky today. But there is an ambiguity because you have to know the entire expansion history of the universe, you know, from the time that that mode is created until today. And we don't know how uh, the details of reheating, so how the energy density of the inflaton gets transferred to the standard model degrees of freedom. Except that here, if we have only the standard model, or if you add some uh, dark matter and small scales, it doesn't really make a difference. You know what happens and you can do the calculation uh, the details of the Higgs field breaking up um, and decaying to standard model particles is quite complicated. The calculation has to be done on the lattice, and this was done by Juan Garcia Bellido, Dani Figueroa, and Javier Rubio uh, in 2008. Uh, so, one about one year after the Higgs, after Higgs inflation was proposed. And uh, so Daniel Figuera, Javier Rubio has since, since then been postdocs with us in Helsinki. Uh, and so you know that N is 50. Uh, 
So then you just have to insert 50 here and you get the scalar spectral index is 0.96. Turns out the scalar ratio is a few times 10 to the minus three. And then this um, amplitude, so if you put in the amplitude, that's two times 10 to the minus nine, then this tells you the Higgs quadratic coupling divided by psi squared is about 10 to the minus nine. So if you compare these two observations, so this is from the pl final Planck data set and analysis. So on the x-axis is this from is the spectral index. On the y-axis is the tensor to scalar ratio. Uh, these different lines are just different inflationary models. So you can just forget about them. Just look at the half ellipse in the center. And these different colors are different data sets, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter which data sets you choose. So this is the prediction for Higgs inflation. NS is 0.96 and these R is five times to the minus three. So it's at the moment, the upper limit on R is something like 0 0.08 or 0 0.07. Uh, so it's R is not detected yet, but next generation C CMB observations will be able to, to distinguish whether R is five to the minus 10 to five times to the minus 10 to five times 10 to the 10 to the minus three Osmo. And this prediction of Higgs inflation is look very comfortable here. And let me emphasize how remarkable this is because this is really, this is not a parameter fit. This is a zero parameter prediction. You can ab adjust absolutely nothing at this, at this level that we are talking about. So if you go back, it's really, you calculate the number of e-folds from the lattice. This comes from the decay of the Higgs, uh, the breakup of the Higgs after inflation. Uh, these spectral indices come from the form of the potential and this psi, that's the only new parameter you included, does not affect the spectral index, does not affect the tensor to scalar ratio. So when you do this calculation, you could have found out that the result is something that's completely ruled out by observations and it's not. Now, if lambda, the, so lambda the Higgs quadratic coupling at the, so uh, at the electroweak scale is about 0.13, it runs, so it becomes, it's smaller at the inflationary scale, but if it's 10 to the minus two, 10 to the minus three, then typical value for xi is about 10 to the four. But that's only the, the, and that fixes the amplitude of the CMB. So, so far, this is a great success. So let me now talk about the complications. Although let me pause here to check if you have questions about this basic story. So let me go forward. Uh, the problem is basically that what I discussed was the classical action. So in quantum terms, I'm talking about the three level action. Um, unfortunately, this is not enough to specify the theory. And we have two kinds of complications, which I will discuss in turn. The first complication is that uh, this is the three level action and loop corrections will of course modify this action. So the question is how to calculate loop corrections? What are they? Uh, and this, so this has been discussed a lot in the literature. And something that uh, I have been focusing on and I've tried to highlight uh, is another source of ambiguity, namely what are the gravitational degrees of freedom really in this action? Another way of putting it is, is what is the ultraviolet gravitational completion of this year? But let me first discuss this quantum aspect. Uh, so the, the, I mentioned that we get a flat potential because the Higgs, the no, usual Higgs potential goes <coughs> like the field to power four. And then it gets divided by, what, by this square of the non monal coupling, which goes like H squared. And this is because we included only dimension four terms in the potential. Now, if you go higher, this property is spoiled. It's easy to see. If the, for example, you, if you go one, uh, if you include terms up to dimension six, then the potential will have terms of Higgs to power six. And the conformal factor will have terms of Higgs to power four. So this is six divided by four squared, one over H squared, the potential will not be exponentially flat. Uh, and then you will get loop corrections. Uh, and on the positive side, something that was realized almost immediately 
is that if you do loop corrections, you know, the Higgs quality coupling runs. Uh, and then people suggested that this spoils inflation. If, if you take only one loop corrections and you have a problem, two loop corrections, uh, things actually look quite nice. And it's quite a nice feature that this now means that the inflationary predictions then depend on the Higgs on top mass. As you may know, uh, the Higgs quartic coupling depends, the running at high scales, the value at high scales is very sensitive to the value of the Higgs, to the value of the strong coupling constant, to the value of the top mass. For example, you may have uh, followed some of this discussion on whether the Higgs standard model vacuum is stable or not, you know, and it's in the metastable area. And if you adjust these parameters a little, you move to the unstable area or to the uh, stable area. So in principle, this is quite nice because this means that you could measure the standard model parameters in colliders to high precision, calculate the running, calculate then the predictionary infl inflationary predictions for this modified potential and see if what you see on the sky matches this. So you could get this sort of very novel consistency condition, which I think, which for any other inflationary model would be very hard to get. And if you could verify this, this would be you know, extremely strong evidence for inflation, that inflation really happened uh, and that it's inflation and not some other mechanism. The problem is that this theory is not renormalizable. I mean, simply because gravity is involved and in the original frame when you have non coupling, the already at three level, actually gravitons uh, at high Higgs field values, uh, are, so on inflationary scales, but the field value Higgs field has a large vacuum expectation value, then the gravitons are at three level as important as W or Z bosons. If you go to, the, to this minimally coupled frame, then you see this non renormalizability in the fact that the potential is obviously not a polynomial. So if when you, so when you renormalize at every order, loop order, you generate terms that have a new functional form. So uh, there are different ways how to, to deal with this. I don't want to discuss the details. There's lots of papers on this, but I think it's fair to say that in the end, how to deal with these loop corrections all born down to prescriptions, different kinds of prescriptions. Uh, so one might hope that maybe, maybe it works so that you uh, preserve this inflationary plateau. And there is some evidence of that. However, you can also open up qualitatively new kinds of inflationary regimes. So let's look at this plot. So here I have on the, on the y-axis is the Higgs potential for this, uh, uh, this modified potential where you have this non coupling taken into account. And then on the x-axis, I have the Higgs field value, you know, psi h squared divided by one plus psi h squared so that the infinite Higgs field range from zero to infinity gets plotted from zero to one. Obviously you cannot really read derivatives from this plot, only the field values. So what I have, the lowest curve here is uh, the Higgs potential in the case when the inflation, when these loop corrections don't really change what's going on. So this uptick, short uptick at the end, close to one, uh, is actually this infinitely long inflationary plateau in terms of H. So you can inflate there and there's evidence that this is not spoiled by loops. If you tune up the loop corrections and you fine tune them, you can, you can get an inflection point there where the second derivative, usually also the first derivative of the potential is zero, then uh, you can make the field uh, run faster and uh, you can boost your gravitational waves. Uh, or if you want, you can put your, if you tune the quantum corrections a little bit, you can get this sort of a false vacuum. You can put your Higgs there, but unfortunately then you have the same problem as in the original inflationary model proposed by Gazanas and Goose namely that the field is just there in the false vacuum and when it tunnels out, then your universe doesn't look homogeneous because of bubbles. Uh, so you need some new physics to solve that. Or then you can put your field in the hilltop where it can roll off the hilltop very slowly. And then again, you have different behavior than on the plateau. And which of these is physically relevant depends on what you do with the loop corrections. Uh, there is another problem. However, when you calculate loops, when you run, because what you want to do is you want to calculate the loops, you want to run from the electroweak scale up to the inflationary scale. Um, the problem is that uh, this new coupling in the 
non-minimally coupled frame, it's a new coupling between Higgs and gravitons. Uh, in the minimally coupled frame, you have a different potential, so you have a different self-coupling of the Higgs. Um, and this leads to violation of perturbative unitarity uh, when the Higgs field is large. This is actually quite easy to understand because recall the discussions before the start of the LHC that the LHC is a safe bet. It has to find either the Higgs or new physics because without the Higgs, the standard model is not unitary around the, loses perturbative unitarity around the electroweak scale. And this of course is because the longitudinal components of the W and the Z bosons uh, come actually from the Higgs. So, so this means if you look at the standard model, if you look at W scattering, Z scattering, you need the Higgs to unitarize those diagrams around the electroweak scale. Uh, now, if you add this non-normal coupling uh, between the Higgs and gravity, you uh, spoil this fine tuning between the Ws and the Higgses, and as a result, you lose unitarity on a scale. So M Planck is one, so this scale is M Planck divided by Xi. And so if lambda is, you know, 0.1 or 0.01 or something, this basically means that you lose perturbative unitarity around 10 to the 14 GeV. So Xi is around 10 to the 4, M Planck divided by that is 10 to the 14 GeV. So this goes a very high scale and makes no difference for your collider experiments. I mean, don't think that this, this theory is the final answer. So the fact that it loses unitarity around some big scale doesn't make a difference. The problem is that during field inflation, the Higgs field vacuum expectation value is around 10 to the 16 GeV. So this means that you lose perturbative unitarity before that. Uh, there are two ways to solve this. One is that this, note that on the first line I say in the electroweak vacuum. However, during inflation you're not in the electroweak vacuum and you should not expand your fields around zero. You should expand them around this very large field value, in which case the behavior of the uh, Higgs is different. Um, and, uh, there's, and you have a field dependent background scale and this actually moves the perturbative unitarity cutoff, can move it to higher scales. A possible solution too that I will discuss a little bit is that uh, you have a different theory of gravity and this will solve it. Because basically in some sense what this non coupling is doing is that it's bringing gravitational problems from the Planck scale down to Planck scale divided by Xi. So if you change how gravity works uh, you can get around this and in one sense actually this is kind of a boon. Because people always say oh you know it's very difficult to test Planck scale physics and so on but in this case actually part of the Planck scale physics is coming down because of this large coupling between gravity and the Higgs. So let me discuss uh, this gravitational side now. So now I'm done with this quantum loop corrections um, and I want to discuss this, the work that I've been doing with others, which is the gravitational aspects of Higgs inflation. So let me start by, by explaining what I mean uh, by different theories of gravity. So if we have in the standard model a very well tested theory of particle physics uh, and we haven't seen any direct deviations from that apart from neutrino masses. Now on the gravity side of course we have general relativity which is very well tested in the weak field regime um, and uh, so we'd like to stick to GR and not to introduce uh, some arbitrary complications. However, it's important then as to which version of GR we are sticking to, because there are different ways to formulate general relativity and actually Einstein himself proposed a number of different ways to write down the theory of gravity. And I want to emphasize that these are not modified theories, but alternative theories of gravity. So usually when people discuss modified gravity, what they mean is that you start with the Einstein-Hilbert action and then you add new terms, for example. So you have like a a tree trunk and then you grow branches of this tree. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about different formulations. So this is a whole new tree where the trunk looks actually the same as it does for usual GR, but then the branches are different. So let me, and we have to be explicit about which formulation of GR we use and actually find that in particular, the Higgs field forces us to be specific. So let me try to, uh, I won't get into the mathematics of, uh, of, of these different formulations of GR too much, but let me explain in words 
what I'm talking about. And again, you know, feel free to interrupt and, and ask questions. Now, in general relativity, uh, if you think of a manifold, so space-time, then the space-time geometry is expressed in two, has two different aspects to it, the metric and the connection. So the metric uh, describes, of course, distances in space-time and also gives you the inner product of vectors. The connection, on the other hand, tells you uh, what kind of lines are straight and also gives you uh, derivatives of vectors. So it tells you how vectors are changing if you, when you move around your space time. Now, uh, in general relativity, it's just assumed, so the, the usual formulation of relativity, which is a metric formulation followed by Hilbert and Einstein in 1915, it's assumed that the lines, that, that, that the straight lines are those that give you a local extremum of the distance. So for space-like lines that are the shortest lines. But a priori, these properties are completely independent. If you take a general manifold, the question, is this line straight? And does this line give me a minimum distance or extremum of distance between two points? These have nothing to do with each other. And in, in the usual original formulation of GR, it was assumed that straight lines are those that give you the, the, give you the extremum distance. Ten years later, Einstein introduced the Palatini formulation, which he named after Palatini. And so, uh, and so although one could call it, you know, the Einstein formulation, uh, where you keep the connection that tells you what kind of lines are straight as an independent degree of freedom. So it's determined by the field equations. You don't constrain it a priori. And actually from this uh, point of view, from the point of view of the Palatini formulation, the metric formulation, in the metric formulation, you have two kinds of degrees of freedom and you put a constraint between them. So actually the way it, it's like putting a Lagrange multiplier in the action for some of your variables. In the Palatini formulation, you don't do that. Now it turns out that for the Einstein-Hilbert action, where the gravity action is given just by the Ricci scalar, as we discussed, uh, these formulations are equivalent because if you have only the Ricci scalar, then the equation of motion for the connection tells you that this connection is given in terms of the metric in such a way that straight lines are lines of extremum distance. So from this point of view, the difference between metric and Palatini formulations is philosophical. They're physically equivalent. There's no difference between them. If you think that you want to have a smaller number of independent fields, then the metric formulation is nicer. If you think that you don't want to have arbitrary constraints and you want things to be determined by the equation of motion, then the Palatini formulation is nicer. This changes if the action is more complicated. So if the gravity action includes terms different than the Ricci scalar, for example, if you have square of the Ricci scalar, then uh, the equation of motion for the connection no longer gives you the usual connection, or if matter couples directly to the connection. Now, uh, we know the Higgs field exists. So nature is described by scalar tensor theory. So often scalar tensor theories are dis uh, in the physics literature are discussed as, you know, possible, you know, hypothetical scenarios, but this is not the case. I and mean, we know that beams don't exist, but scalar, tensor theory of, of, but scalar tensor theory is the one that actually describes our gravity. So, and we, as I mentioned, the Higgs necessarily has a non coupling to the Ricci scalar. This is generated by quantum corrections. You can't avoid it. And, and the connection depends on, and the Ricci scalar depends on the connection. So the presence of the Higgs field breaks the equivalence between these two formulations of general relativity and there are other formulations that I won't have time to talk about and the Higgs field also breaks uh, this equivalence between them. And this was realized very quickly. Bauer and Demir pointed this out about five months after Higgs inflation was proposed, you know, for Higgs inflation and, and calculated uh, the differences at three level. So uh, let me go through this three level calculation and discuss a little bit what happens when we include loops. So, this, so the action is the same in both cases, but now I've explicitly written here. Uh, so here we have the first time we have the normal coupling, we have the inverse metric, and then we have the Ricci tensor. 
And there I put gamma, T gamma, where gamma is the connection. So here, now, so this is the Palatini formulation. So note now that here, the, there, are, there is no kinetic terms on the metric. So actually the Palatini formulation, the metric is an auxiliary field and the dynamical field is the connection. So we can again now do this conformal transformation for the metric. Uh, so you see that now here, this one plus psi h squared gets transferred to under this kinetic term and the square of that under the potential. And in this case, uh, the Ricci tensor doesn't change at all because it depends on the connection. Uh, so actually this Palatini case also calculationally simpler. And again, we do the same thing as in the metric case. We define a new uh, kinet field such that we get a canonical kinetic term so that we know how to interpret the potential easily. In the metric case, now, now if we look at this metric case, uh, what's under the square root a bit more closely, we have here in the numerator one plus psi h squared. And in the denominator, uh, we have uh, six psi squared h squared. So actually, I think I want to move this cursor around a bit. So let me uh, switch to presenting like this. So uh, here, uh, this part, six h squared, psi squared h squared, comes from the derivative of the conformal factor. In the Palatini case, we don't have that, and that's the only difference. So in both cases, the polynomials are transferred uh, into exponentially flat potentials. The difference is that in the metric case, we have an exponential of the field with some coefficient of order unity. And here instead, in the Palatini case, we get root, square root of xi in the exponential. And it turns out that xi in the Palatini case is typically like uh, 10 to the 10. So we get not only a potential that's exponentially flat, but a potential that's exponentially, exponentially flat from this extremely simple uh, construction. So we don't have to do uh, like, uh, I don't know, take V brains and put them at angles to each other or whatever. You just start from the standard model, include this term which you have to include, and uh, then you get this automatic. Um, and uh, so now in terms of the minimally coupled field, so now if you first do this conformal transformation and uh, get rid of this normal coupling, and then you do this field rate definition, then we have shifted all of the differences on the gravity sector in the way the connection behaves to the potential of this minimally coupled field. So in the metric case, we had an exponentially flat potential like this. In the Palatini case, we also have an exponentially flat potential. Uh, the only difference is now uh, that uh, if you look at the exponent, so if you look at the uh, exponents, in the metric case, we have here coefficient of order one, and here we have exponentially flat exponential potential. Now, the flatter the potential, the slower the Higgs field runs, and the slower the Higgs field runs, the smaller is the amplitude of gravitational waves relative to the, relative to the amplitude of scalar perturbations. So uh, now if you compare this, what this means for the predictions, they depend on reheating, but this is the standard model, so reheating is known. And uh, this reheating in the Palatini case is actually different because the shape of the potential is different and it's actually simpler, stachyonic reheating. Uh, and this was calculated by uh, my postdoc Javier Rubio here in Helsinki and Emily Thunberg at the time was my PhD student and who is now a postdoc in Tallinn. So both for the metric and Palatini case, we know how reheating happens and the number is, there are small differences in the number, but it's, a, it's around 50. So in the metric case and the Palatini case, the spectral index is the same, 0.96, which recall could fit to the observations, but uh, and the difference is in the spectra, is in the tensor to scalar ratio, which was a prediction that does not depend on xi in the metric case. In the Palatini case, it depends on xi, and the typical value is, you know, 10 to the minus, less than 10 to the minus 10. So if we look at the observations again, uh, here 
above this 0.96, so above this, directly above this blue arrow, this uh, green dot slightly above the line, that's the metric case. And then the Palatini case is that's about 10 to the minus 12 or something. So that's about one atoms on your screen, like one atoms with above zero. So it's so small that it's, it's difficult to imagine any experiment in the future that could measure it. So now we have a, what this means is that this, you know, arcane question of GR, you know, what is the correct formulation of general relativity has an impact, a very clear impact on the CND if Higgs is the influence. Or Higgs or another non-minimally coupled field, of course, but I'm concentrating on the Higgs. Uh, so this is a very clear prediction. Now uh, we can again complicate matters, uh, you know, by looking at the loop corrections. So what happens if we, uh, because this is only three level, and as I mentioned, we have to see what happens when we go quantum corrections. And now the predictions of Higgs inflation, which in the beginning were so simple, you know, you had one parameter, it doesn't even affect the spectral index, it doesn't even affect the tensor to scalar ratio, their predictions. Now, uh, it turns out that you have to specify what are your loop corrections, and you have to specify what is your formulation of GR, you know. So the good side is that you can differentiate between different formulations of GR from observations of the CMB. The bad side is that in order to get prediction for Higgs inflation, a number, you have to specify what is your theory of gravity. So obviously the loop corrections for non-renormalizable non theory depend on your particle physics completion. So what is the ultraviolet model that the standard model is an approximation of? And now they also depend on what is the gravitational completion. So for example, in loop quantum gravity, you would get something like Palatine. And there the connection is independent variable from the metric from the beginning. And in string theory, well, I'm sure there are different constructions, but typically would get rather the metric formulation. Uh, and now if you look at what happens if we include both loop corrections, parametrized, you know, in some way, because uh, using some prescriptions for the loop corrections, which are more or less reliable, and we compare uh, the formulation of GR. Uh, so this is from a paper of mine, and Lomi Puri Walman, who at the time was a PhD student of mine, so uh, on the x-axis, as in the previous, as in the Planck plot, is the spectral index for scalar perturbations. This dot uh, in the lower middle is the three-level case, so ns.96. On the x-axis is now in logarithmic units, the tensor to scalar ratio, the color is just the running of the spectral index, so you don't have to care about that. So now this point, when you include quantum corrections, gets spread that if you take into account that you get loop corrections to the quadratic coupling of the Higgs, uh, then you can get a smaller spectral index and you can also get a higher tensor to scalar ratio. On the right, we do the same thing, but for Palatini. And you see that for the Palatini case, uh, the spectral index is not really enough to differentiate. In both cases, you can go from 0.96 to uh, lower values. But uh, now in the Palatini case, you basically cannot get a tensor to scalar ratio higher than 10 to the minus four, whatever you do, uh, because you're always suppressed by this large power uh, of the exponential, so your potential is always very flat. Uh, so the metric range, but even including these loop corrections, even though they widen the predictions, you see that this whole metric range of R, of tensor to scalar ratio, because it doesn't go below few times 10 to the minus three, is with the range of next generation experiments, for the Palatini, this is not the case. Now we can look at what happens if you put your field under Hilt, let it roll from there. Uh, we have a similar kind of plot again on the, here for the metric case, on the X axis, we have the spectral index, Y axis now in on linear scale, tensor to scalar ratio times 10 to the three. So again, you see, you know, you can change the predictions, but n is, is less than, is 0.96 or smaller, and r is at most, is of the odd, it's not much smaller than 10 to minus 3. Uh, in the metric case, 
And this is uh, the realization group running. Uh, so here we take the standard model, three loop realization group equations, run them up, and then we take the realization group equations for the, for the so-called chiral standard model, which applies when the Higgs field vacuum expectation value is large. So in the inflationary uh, plateau, we take those and we run them down, and then we match in between. Uh, to, and allow for some jumps to uh, parameterize the fact that there can be some unknown physics in between that we don't know. If we look at the Palatini case, again, spectral index 0.96 and smaller, but again, look at the y-axis, logarithm base 10 of tensor to scalar ratio, 10 to the minus 9 or smaller. So once again, we see that the next generation experiment should be able to see gravitational waves from Higgs inflation if the metric theory formulation of general relativity is true, and if the Palatini formulation is true, you should not see that. Uh, the Palatini formulation also affects the unitarity problem. Now in the Palatini formulation, uh, you don't have the derivative of the conformal factor. So you have the conformal the non-minimal coupling between the Higgs and the uh, Ricci scalar, which is 1 plus Xi H squared. Uh, and you get derivatives of that in the metric case, because when you do the conformal transformation, the Ricci scalar depends on derivatives of the metric. So you put some scalar field dependence on the metric, you get derivatives of the scalar field. In the Palatini case, this doesn't happen. So then there are no terms like Xi H there, only Xi H squared. So there is no scale of m Planck divided by Xi there, only m Planck divided by square root of Xi. Now numerically, this is about the same scale, because in the metric case, Xi is about 10 to the 4. The Palatini case, Xi is about 10 to the 10. This comes from the normalization of CMB perturbations, recall. So both of them were about 10 to the 14 GeV or so. But in the Palatini case, the inflationary scale comes down. So uh, now it's 1 over square root of Xi, but now Xi is 10 to the 10, not 10 to the 4. So actually, you lose this perturbative unitarity around the inflationary scale, which is a bit uncomfortable, but it could be OK. And so this unitarity problem, the problem that the, double, that the Ws and the Higgses don't match uh, on large Higgs field values here is solved by a different Higgs effective, poten effective potential, which is parameterizing your different theory of gravity. So this can address the particle physics issue. Of course, this particle physics issue, this is like a particle physics gravity issue. This is facts related to the fact that the Planck scale the effective Planck scale has come down. So uh, let me uh, conclude. Uh, Higgs inflation uh, is a very minimal bottom-up scenario for particle physics and gravity, where you use the known degrees of use the known degrees of freedom that you have on the particle physics side, the known de degrees of freedom that you have on the gravity side, uh, and then you have to really say what are those degrees of freedom on the gravity side? Is it only the metric, or is it the metric and the connection? Uh, and because the Higgs couples to the connection, different formulations of GR are in equivalent theories. And they're in, in equivalent, but in a sense equal, in the sense that the metric formulation, the Palatini formulation is not less fundamental than the metric formulation. You really don't know which one you should start with, except if you start from like some blue quantum gravity or string theory that will tell you, you know, which tree trunk do you have to start with. Now predictions of Higgs inflation depend as you, can, as you have seen, depend quite strongly on the theory of gravity and no loop corrections. Um, and this uh, allows you, in principle, if you know how to do with these loop corrections, to have a very nice consistency conditions between collider experiments and, and uh, cosmological measurements. At the moment, how we don't know how to do it, um, because this theory is non-renormalizable, non so it's very unclear. Uh, the effect of the theory of gravity is, is more clear, and roughly speaking, if you compare the metric and the Palatini, in the Palatini case, the tensor to scalar ratio is much smaller. So you should not expect to see it in future experiments, and in the metric formulation you should, regardless of whether you modify the shape of the potential that you have an inflection point, or, or you run from a hilltop, or, or whatever, this feature is pretty robust. And there are also other formulations of gravity, like the teleparallel formulation, which was also introduced by Einstein in 1928, 
three years after Palatini, we did one paper on that. And then also you can get different results than in the Palatini and the uh, uh, metric case. And I realized I didn't uh, touch at all on how we can get dark matter from the Higgs. If somebody is interested, I can explain it very shortly. But for now, I'll uh, stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, anyone who has questions, please write on the group chat and I will unmute you. Um, in the meantime, while people are writing, let me ask about dark matter because I'm interested in <laughs> Okay, so, uh, so this is actually very simple. The idea is that, so this is the, so the idea is that, so this is the Higgs potential. So it, this chi is the minimally coupled field. On the x-axis, y-axis, we have the Higgs um, potential. So if we go far to the right, to very large field values, this is where inflation happens. So you have this flat plateau. Now, what we want to do is we want to, after that, so between that, so after the inflation, after the regime where the inflationary perturbations are created, we want to create much smaller scale perturbations. So later in inflation, in a regime where the field moves very, very slowly. And in inflation, for those who are not, don't work on inflation, the slower the field rolls, the bigger are the perturbations of the field. So if the field runs uh, very rapidly, then you don't have uh, lots of perturbations. So if you introduce if we tune to standard model Riemann, we can tune to standard model Riemannization group. So we can again take the standard model three loop Riemannization group equations coming from the electroweak side. Uh, so on the left of this figure, and then you can take the Riemannization group equations on this chiral standard model on the right hand side, and match them in between. And now you can tune your parameters such that you get uh, what is here. You have the dotted line where also the arrow is that you have an inflection point or something like that where the field slows down. You actually need to have a local shallow minimum. Then what happens, uh, so this is work by myself and Emily Thunberg, who at the time was my PhD student. So you have a feature that slows down the field and the slower the field runs, the bigger are the perturbations. So now this, if you have some, so now you generate very large perturbations. These perturbations are created they exit the Hubble radius, after inflation they come back in, and then the entire hub in, and in a region where you have these perturbations, where you're in the, then, I mean, so the perturbations are, of course, uh, they have a spectrum. So you have a probability distribution for them, and when you're in the tail of the distribution and the density perturbations are very large, bigger than one, then the entire Hubble radius collapses to black holes. So, and then these black holes, uh, then you can generate actually using this mechanism, if you wanted them to be standard model today to satisfy the observational constraints and to get the CNB correct from this, then actually you need the black holes, the initial mass to be about one ton, so 10 to the six grams, then they evaporate by Hawking radiation and you have Planck scale relics. So, so today the mass is about one Planck mass, so about one microgram, and these, these sort of, relic black holes can be all of the dark matter and they satisfy every observational constraint. Thank you. Ah, Raul. Hi, Sixi. Nice to see you after so many years. <laughs> Good to hear you. I, I have two questions. Um, yes. The first one is, um, uh, what about, so this uh, non-minimal coupling to the Higgs there. Um, I wonder what is, how robust that is in the presence of the loop corrections. Let me say what I mean by this. So yes. suppose you have the bare coupling to the Higgs there, uh, but then suppose that the rest of the matter is not non-minimally coupled in the same way. Um, yeah. Then those loop corrections, it's not clear to me that, uh, that uh, the loop corrections to the Higgs will inherit the non-minimal coupling of the Higgs and not the minimal coupling from whatever is generating those loops. So can you explain a little bit how, how why is this uh, non-minimal coupling robust or how does it inherit or not inherit those loop corrections? How, yeah. how does it extend to those loop corrections? Yeah, so first of all, let me note that uh, if you look at these dimension four terms, then in the standard model, there is only the Higgs that can have a coupling like this. 
because it's the only scalar field. And of course, during inflation, then all of the other fields are driven basically to zero. Only this, only the Higgs is relevant. Uh, you can calculate this, you can just include, you can just take this action that I have displayed here and you can add the Xi to the renormalization group equations, just like you add, you have the other parameters of the standard model. Uh, you can treat it like any other parameter and it runs, but the effect of loop corrections on this Xi is actually negligible. Like it runs very, very slowly. Uh, and basically the reason for this, that if you, that, that, uh, is basically because the biggest contribution to that is comes from the Higgs quadric coupling lambda and at large field values lambda is driven to a very small value. So basically this Xi gets frozen. So this, so this treating this Xi as just a constant parameter, which I did here is actually uh, extremely robust. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the smallest right. problem that this theory has. Yeah. So that's very interesting. So the, the other question is related to the calculation of the scalar to tensor ratio in the Palatini yeah. formulation specifically. Now, I have never really managed to look at how you, one computes that in this case, but th the question is this, uh, is it still true that we can estimate the amplitude of gravitational waves just by looking at the slow roll parameters in Palatini formulation? Is yes. it still true? Yes. So in the so if you looked at the it, is an auxiliary field, and that the and the and the connection gets a dynamics of, of its own. Is it the same calculation still? So how? <laughs> it's yeah, 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 yeah. This is a good question. So so if you start from this, so it all depends which field coordinates you use. And in this case, if you look at this action that I have here, the field uh, you have three fields actually. You have the Higgs field, the metric, and then you have the connection. So if you and now if you calculate, for example, for this, what the connection is, then, so if you vary this action with respect to connection, solve the equation of motion for the connection, then actually the connection depends on the metric and also on the Higgs field. So whether your lines are straight or not is determined not only by the value of the metric, but also by the value of the Higgs. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, and if you use this frame, indeed, you cannot use the normal solar parameters uh, alone to calculate what happens. But now if you move, to this frame. So this, so if you do this conformal transformation, then you move uh, this non-normal coupling to the kinetic term. And now if you vary this action with respect to the connection, you get the equation of motion that now the action, now the connection, the solution to the equation of motion is just that the, the connection is the usual metric connection. Then you can insert back to the action and then this looks exactly uh, the same as in the metric theory, but just with a different effective potential. So the trick is that you roll all of this gravitational physics to the potential of the, to first to the kinetic term and potential of the Higgs, and then you roll all of it to the potential of the Higgs. But then in the, in the Einstein frame, is it true, still true that the bunch day vacuum is, I mean, the, we expect the bunch day vacuums to be in the, uh, in the Jordan frame, is it, it, or, does, or it doesn't matter really? What is uh, yeah? What so the, the right. So the uh, the spectral index and the uh, tensor to scalar ratio are independent of this change of field coordinates. Okay. All right. Okay. This is in general. So so we did some. So we looked at some more complicated actions. And by the way, this is not in general true for the slow roll parameters. The slow roll parameter eta, for example, is not invariant under field transformations, but the combination that goes into observables is invariant. Mm. Okay. All right. Great. Very nice. Okay. Um, any further questions? Um, well, thank you very much. We appreciate it also because it was very late for you. Oh, wait, we have one more question. Good. Um, Ademir, let me... Let me unmute you, which I think you can do yourself, but, but let me do it. Are you unmuted now? Oh, ah. May I talk now? 
Yeah, please. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I have a, I have two simple questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, uh, the first is uh, in in Higgs inflation, uh, there is the possibility of the universe start in a De Sitter model. I mean, uh, uh, instead to wait some time and start the 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 inflationary regime. May the universe driven by by Higgs. It may start from a, a decent solution, like uh, in the Starobinsky model, for instance. This is a uh, this is the first question. The second question, if you if you want, you may answer that now, and I I, I may ask you after. Oh, then I, I will do the question now. Okay, so to answer this question, so uh, so we of course don't know what happened before inflation. We don't know how inflation got started. Uh, if you look at this, the potential that we have here, that is, uh, so if you look at this potential, these potentials that are exponentially flat, if you go to very, very large field values, um, then in fact, you enter, so if you say that you want to go closer and closer to the sitter, so the sitter would of course be constant potential only, field doesn't change. So if you make the field value larger and larger, the potential does get closer and closer to a constant, but, but then eventually you will go to the, uh, the field rolls slower and slower, and eventually you go to the regime of eternal inflation. So, uh, so if you try to push this, you know, to perfect the sitter, what happens is that you end up in this self-replicating regime of eternal inflation. I don't know if this answers your question. Oh, okay, no, it, it's okay. Uh, the second question is the following. Uh, uh, some authors have, uh, have discussed uh, the connection between Higgs inflation and the dark energy. Uh, there is there is actually a relation unit in the the uh, the spectral the scalar spectral index with the equation of state the the parameter of the equation oh, of yeah. dark yes. energy. Could yes. you talk a little bit? Oh, okay, you don't talk about that, but <laughs> if you may talk a little bit. It should be good for me. Yeah, yeah. So this is a proposal uh, by Javier Rubio, among others, who is a postdoc in Helsinki. So I haven't worked on that. But there, the, the basic setup there is that you add an extra field to make the theory uh, classically conformally inv uh, invariant. Uh, you know, so that you don't have a constant Planck mass, you have some field there. And then you, ba and then you use these fields so that one of these fields, uh, the, the remnant potential of one of these fields gives you the dark energy. Uh, and then indeed, if you do inflation there, uh, you will find that the inflationary predictions for the spectral index and the equation of state for dark energy is correlated. But if you want to hear about that, I recommend that you invite Javier Rubio uh, to give you a seminar on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? If not, again, thank you very much. I know it's also late <laughs> where you are. No thank problem. You. Thank you everyone for participating. I will close the recording right now.